What's it like working with some of the smartest folks in the world solving impossible and out of this earth problems? <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting because the uh, people are actually looking at really big questions and uh, coming up with interesting answers. So the discovery of dark energy was one of those where uh, we were just trying to you know measure sort of the size of the universe and the, what we call the expansion rate of the universe, the galaxies moving apart. And we just figured gravity was the main thing happening. So gravity, when you throw a ball up in the air, it falls back down. So the universe was set into motion with a big bang or something like that. And ever since then, the gravity has been slowing it down. But all of a sudden we say, wait a minute, the universe is accelerating. How is that possible? And so you, you people who have actually looked at the data very meticulously over many, many years, and, and it's, it's sort of a real dedication uh, to data that people have had to, to, to find all the little biases and all the little errors in the data to actually say, yeah, there's a real signal in this noise. And the signal is saying our universe is not behaving the way we expect it. So your background's AI and data, and we put a man on the moon without essentially any computing power whatsoever. How in God's name do we do that? And what do, what do the systems look like? What's changed since then? We have uh, so many gadgets and bells and whistles. I mean, it was sort of like stripped down to the barest minimum. And I guess maybe that's why it worked is we didn't add too many features to it. And you know how that could, could get sometimes. If you get too many features to something, it gets complicated and then it doesn't all work together. So you keep it sort of simple. We see with some of these uh, commercial space launch companies is they're, is they're, they're trying to think of like an assembly line process, how you can commoditize the lift vehicle and uh, minimize the cost of getting things into space. And so that I think is a really good sort of competitive environment to, to enable more kinds of things to happen in space, whether it's you know, commercial development or, or just human exploration or whatever it happens to be. You know, if we can sort of solve the problem where it, it used to be like at NASA, the story was something like it would, it would it cost you like, I don't even remember the number, like a, a $2,000 to lift one single pound into space okay so if you think about a space shuttle which weighed you know a million pounds i mean you know it was basically about a billion dollars per launch that was a lot of money just to put something into space right just to launch a satellite just just to get it into space you're spending a billion dollars not even counting the development of the satellite so now if you try to commoditize that you can reduce that price from two thousand dollars per pound to just a handful of dollars per now you can launch all kinds of interesting things, uh, like schools are participating in these CubeSat projects, mini, mini nano satellites. And I was just talking with one of our new employees in my company today, and she came from a university where they actually built a CubeSat, as they're called, and launched this little satellite on the, on piggyback on on one of those commercial space launches. And so now. You're training the next generation in engineering and science and technology with really hands-on amazing stuff. And I, I think that's inspirational to young people to get into science and technology, which I think we, we need to keep finding those motivators to keep the brightest and best of our young people you know, looking uh, into, into these types of uh, technological innovative spaces. So whether it's energy usage or uh, transportation or, you know, or whatever, uh, I think we're gonna see sort of in, in the smart city type of environment uh, is the sort of connective tissue, if you will, and then the digital uh, sensors that we have in the, within the environment, whether it's in the roads and the, and the, and the lights, you know, in the traffic patterns and in our businesses, whatever. When do you think we get to the point of like a, a five or a $10,000 ticket to the moon or to the space station or in general space? Uh, back in the day, that it was two, it cost basically two thousand dollars to lift a pound of anything into space. So if you were a person, you know, and you, you you're talking just to lift you into space is a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, now we're, we're we're moving that cost to a few dollars per pound. So so, and what I mean by the cost to lift, I mean it's it's the fuel cost, it's it's the it's the refurbishment cost of a spacecraft. So if you have a disposable rocket. Like in the olden days of NASA, the most of the rockets were disposable. Well, they were very expensive. But nowadays, on these commercial launches, they reach, you know, they retrieve the booster and they refurbish it and reuse it. So there's a savings there. So the commodity costs are getting reduced, and it will, I think, we'll get to that point where we'll be able to do that. Get get into a view from the space station for your honeymoon or for your 
20th anniversary or whatever whatever cool event you're trying to celebrate, it might actually be worth it for some people. If there's one thing that you would want to leave people with, a quote, a call to action, what would it be and why? Think about what motivates you, what gets you up in the morning. I always tell people, you know, if you do what you love, you'll always love what you're doing. So, so do what you love and, uh, and don't do it because someone says, hey, this is a good career path. Do it because it's something you want to do.